Welcome to the Rideshare Share Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. So Chris Baggett has been an ent- entrepreneur, leader, and futurist in data-driven software and data innovation for more than 20 years. In the early 2000s, Baggett co-founded Exact Target, which was later acquired by tech giant Salesforce for $2.7 billion. In 2015, Baggett brought his tech background to the on-demand food delivery market as co-founder and CEO of Cluster Truck, a software platform that powers profitable, vertically integrated delivery-only kitchens. Chris is also an avid angel investor and mentor to tech startups that are fueling the next generation of innovation. A native of Pittsburgh, Chris now resides near Indianapolis in Greenfield, Indiana. So, Chris, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm excited to chat about food delivery. It's about 11 a.m. here, my time. So by the time we get done, I'm going to be ready for lunch and probably be (laughs) ordering some food delivery myself. Excellent. Awesome. So, you know, while we're talking food, uh, I am curious to know, what's uh, what's your favorite delivery food to order? Well, you know, I'm dedicated to ordering from Cluster Truck. And, um, okay. you know, my favorite time of day to eat is like about 10 to 1030. So I order breakfast. We have a, a your way breakfast, we call it, which is, you know, two runny eggs, bacon, toast, um, yeah. t- potatoes. Yeah, just like a classic American breakfast. And I eat it just about every day, although I had a ham and cheese omelet today. Oh, very nice. All right. Well, that's a good answer and leads me to kind of what, why you're here today to talk about cluster trucks. So, um, you know, can you quickly tell us what is cluster truck? Yeah. As you, as you alluded to in the intro, we're a, you know, we're a software forward delivery only kitchen. Um, we Mm. are vertically integrated, so we control everything from the customer interaction. Um, we, have built software in our kitchen that controls all the cooking of the food and we control the driver fleet, uh, 1099 drivers. Uh, and we use a lot of bikes as well. We're probably in some cities like Denver and Indianapolis, we're about 30% bikes. Mm, Cool. And what cities are you operating in right now? Um, currently we have uh, two locations in Indianapolis, a suburban location, um, and a downtown location. And then we're downtown Denver, Columbus, and Kansas city. Okay, cool. So you guys are definitely uh, not small by any means, but also not operating nationally, I guess, yet. Not quite, no. Yeah. And how long has, been, has the company been around for? We started, um, we started coding in 2015, and we launched our first um, operation in early, about March, end of March of 2016. Got it. So is it common for someone like me who, you know, I guess is even, you know, kind of following the industry and well-versed in the industry to have never heard of cluster truck until, you know, just the other day when I decided to interview you? <laughs> well, it's, um, um, you know, we're, we're, I don't know how to describe this without being mean, but we're not like a third party <laughs> delivery company. We're not funded yeah. by SoftBank. You know, yeah. we're just out here doing our work. You know, we have a yeah. very profitable business model that works for the customer it works for the cooks, and most importantly for us, it works for the delivery people. Got it. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's actually really one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on and wanted to learn a little bit more about your business, because I think especially in the food delivery space, we see that there are a number of these kind of smaller, I wouldn't call them mom and pop, but maybe local or regionalized companies that are able to make it work, you know, and they're not the big names of the Postmates or the DoorDash, and you don't have millions of users, but they're definitely making a name for themselves. So as far as the actual uh, structure of the company, is there anything else, where are you guys based? And it sounds like, have you raised money or not raised money self-funded? Yeah, we've, um, we're, we're, um, we're based in Indianapolis. Uh, we've mm-hmm. raised about $30 million. As you mentioned, this is, this is actually my third startup. Um, I had another startup after exact target. Um, it's called compendium software, which was acquired by Oracle. Um, so, you know, got a good reputation and a good network among funding sources. So, you know, it's just, I'm also old and, you know, here in the Midwest, we're kind of <laughs> mature. So it's not like, hey, we're a unicorn. Look at us, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, the most important thing for us is to build a good, sustainable and highly scalable business and and not get ahead of ourselves. So, you know, we look at our, our, our model as sort of laboratories. I don't know if you've seen we just signed a national program with Kroger. Um, okay. You know, so that will help, you know, 
it has potential to leave progress into 2,800 locations quickly. Definitely. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, we're looking at lots of other kinds of partnerships along those lines. Got it. So, I mean, it sounds like the ultimate goal, though, is to potentially com- compete on a national scale with all of the big companies in the food delivery space. Oh, on a global scale. I mean, we have, okay. uh, with, without a lot of hubris, we have the, the best model. You know, we're very fortunate to have not, and this has kind of been my career, but, you know, not necessarily the pioneer, if you will, um, mm-hmm. but um, being able to look at the market as it grows and say, okay, what's wrong here and how can we fix it? And mostly how yeah. can we fix it with software? Yeah, no, I, I like that. I think it makes a lot of sense to let other people spend millions, if not billions of dollars making the mistakes. And then you kind of come in and optimize the process. So let's get into them all. What What is the model? What makes Cluster Truck different from other delivery services? And I guess maybe if you, if you kind of can let us know how it fits in. I mean, are, are you guys the same category as a Postmates or a DoorDash? Or how do you how do you look at yourselves? And then let's talk about how the model works. Well, you know, we're vertically integrated, so we control mm-hmm. every aspect. We don't work with brands. Um, okay. There's a single location that that is central to where the food is made and where it's distributed from. Um, you know, when we started looking at this market, you know, the first thing I saw was Grubhub go public. You know, that's what mm-hmm. brought this to my radar, if you will, like watching CNBC one day, looking at Grubhub and being like, this isn't going to work, you know? <laughs> Uh, you know, and it doesn't work, yeah. right? I mean, you know, I'm sure you're in this space. I'm sure you met, you read uh, Matt's shareholder letter back in October. Yep. Um, you know, and he spells it out very clearly. This is an undifferentiated, commoditized market where a driver can only get one job every 30 to 45 minutes. How am I supposed to pay that person a living mm-hmm. wage when I'm delivering a $15 burrito, right? Yeah. Um, you know, without fees. So, you know, a couple of things we had to look at, you know, who are the constituents here, right? There are restaurants. Well, we're going to disrupt the restaurants. Sorry, we can't help them. Um, yeah. There are customers. What do the customers want, right? Well, they, they don't want to be buried in fees. They want an inexpensive, high quality, reliable and fast service, right? You know, if you go through and look at reviews, you know, go to Trustpilot and type in DoorDash, you'll see that they have one star, um, you know, so from an entrepreneurial standpoint, you're saying, wow, here's this rapidly growing market and the customers hate the incumbent solutions, but they're still using them, waiting for something better to come along. Right. But what yeah. we really focused on was the delivery people as our core constituency. You know, if you think back to 2015, 2016, and it really hasn't changed, but that was a pretty abused group of folks. Right. You know, Travis mm-hmm. has been recorded in a car, you know, to rating a, a, a driver, um, you know, the presidential candidates. And, you know, Hillary Clinton was, you know, talking about legislation for the gig economy just because these people have been so abused. And, um, and we really said, you know what, we're going to build the entire business around the driver being actually more important than the customer. If we Got take it. good care of the driver and make a system that works for the driver, the delivery person, we call them couriers, if we, you know, we will mm-hmm. always have drivers. And if we always have drivers, then we will, and we'll have high quality drivers, then we will be able to give good quality customer service. So, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. we kind of work backwards from that premise. Got it. So what's the main positive you've Im- impact you've seen of having, you know, I'm all for, as you might imagine, I'm all for uh, treating drivers better and couriers better, but I also understand the, the business constraints. So what, what positive impacts on the business have you seen? Has it, I mean, is it the higher retention of drivers, which have, you know, kind of reduced your onboarding costs there, or, you know, like you mm-hmm. mentioned customer support, how is that translated into kind of positive metrics on the business side? So from a driver's standpoint, um, you know, we, we don't recruit like every city we're in, we've got waiting lists of hundreds of drivers, like that we don't need, you know, the whole system works because, (laughs) you know, I don't know this as a fact, but I'm told that the third party delivery companies actually spend more money on driver recruitment than they do on customer recruitment. Um, you know, it's, it, you know, um, the turnover is bad, you know, you know, we looked at it, you know, first of all, there's no dignity, right? You go Mm -hmm. into that restaurant to get food and all eyes turn to look at you and nobody wants to see you. The customers don't want to see a DoorDash person. The employees aren't making an extra nickel, you know, taking care of you. It's a disruption. It's friction. Um, You know, so let's eliminate that 
lack of dignity by making them never have to go into a restaurant, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we also wanted to be the low cost provider, right? So one of our early, you know, specs day one, moment one was it's going to be free delivery always. And okay. so we had to build an economic model that supported free delivery. And the trade off for free delivery is the customer actually has to come out and meet the delivery. So our customers track our delivery drivers like they track an Uber to be picked mm-hmm. up, right? They see it coming down the street, they come out and meet the car, they take the food. So now the driver doesn't have to get out of their car and go into a restaurant, and the driver doesn't have to get out of their car and go find a customer, right? So mm-hmm. now, and re- couple that with they're going back to a single point, right? They're not driving from restaurant A to C to W to X. They're going back to a single box, right? And that box, you know, we have a single restaurant. We have a single kitchen. It's not a cloud kitchen like we're going to have 40 or 50 kitchens in a giant warehouse in the suburb somewhere. You know, ours is a single kitchen built in an urban area close to downtown population centers. Um, And we don't only have it's a six minute delivery radius. It's not really round, right? It looks like a hexagon or something, but amoeba, but you know, the whole idea. So you're saying that you don't deliver to people that are beyond a six minute drive from the kitchen. Exactly. Right. And we do that. It has to be in a busy downtown area. You know, we just opened our first suburban kitchen and our delivery Mm, times are about seven minutes there, which still works. The two reasons are we don't want your food to be on the trick with cluster truck is, because we control the entire system, when a customer places their order, first thing our system does is it says, okay, I'm going to calculate, you know, and this is all machine learning. I'm going to calculate how long it's going to take to make this food. And mm-hmm. I'm also going to calculate how far away you are from the kitchen. And I'm also going to calculate where are my drivers, right? So let's say that we have a brand promise of 30 minutes, and I'm going to tell you when you place your order that you're going to get your food in under 30 minutes. If you're five minutes away from the kitchen and your food is going to take five minutes to make, just to make the math simple, that gives me 20 minutes to do nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So now what the algorithm is doing is managing the delivery people. And I can see driver A, his name is Ken. And Ken is two minutes Mm -hmm. from making a delivery. And then he's going to be six minutes back to the kitchen from that delivery. So eight minutes. I'm actually going to give Ken another job. And that job is ahead of yours, right? And that job is going to take five minutes to cook also. So he's eight minutes away from the kitchen. When he crosses that five minute line, that alerts the kitchen to start cooking his food, right? Mm -hmm. You know, customer B. So now when Ken pulls up to the kitchen, we're handing him customer B's food and he's going to make a five minute delivery out. And on his five minute delivery back, that's when I start cooking Harry's food. Now Ken pulls up, I hand him the food. The food isn't old, right? Even if it's, 30 minute delivery time, the food by definition, because you're five minutes away from the kitchen is not going to be older than five or six minutes. So we maintain a very high degree of quality. If you look at our reviews, because even if a delivery I saw today, we were really busy in, in, uh, um, in Columbus, you know, it's, it's kind of sleeting and cold there. Um, you know, so, you know, we had 55 minute deliveries at, at like 1230, just for a few Mm -hmm. minutes. But, um, even at 55 minutes, your food's not five minutes old. Does that make sense? Right. Got it. And in yeah, that 30 minute period, I've given Ken three jobs, right? Mm-hmm. So now think about Matt Maloney talking about 45 minutes a job and I've given Ken three in half yeah. of that time. So our drivers, because they never go further than six minutes or seven minutes out, it's a 14 minute round trip. That means at minimum they can do four jobs an hour, yeah. right? Yeah. And they yeah, never I mean, have to, to me, get out of the car. Yeah. I mean, to me, it sounds like a lot of what you're doing well is optimizing the operations piece. And I mean, frankly, you know, Uber Eats, Postmates, DoorDash, all these companies are trying to do similar things. But I think what makes you unique is that you own the whole stack, right? Like you said, you're a full service, full scale, um, you know, from top to bottom. And so that, I guess, is there any one piece that Uh, you know, in the normal delivery process creates the most amount of friction that you guys have been able to eliminate? Is it the, you know, like you said, cooking the order and, you know, understanding when to cook it and when not to cook it or how to delay it? Or is it the couriers or the delivery rate? When to to cook different items, right? We're very... Which aspect of what you guys do do you think removes the most friction, I guess is my question. 
you know, it's, 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 a, it's a combination of many, many little things. That's the idea okay. of the machine learning, right? That, that, that we know everything from the customer data and everything about that customer all the way to everything about drivers and proximity and traffic and weather and mm-hmm. how long does it take to mad, make pad thai versus a cheeseburger and how many cheeseburgers do we have in the cloud, which means when do we start the pad thai, which, you know, it's like FedEx, right? If you think about, and I'm not sure how old you are, but if you remember a world before FedEx, like if you mailed a letter or you sent a package, it was going to be five to seven days, right? And Fred Smith came out and said, no, I'm going to get it to you by 1030 the next morning, guaranteed, right? The only way they can do that is to control the entire system. If I'm mm-hmm. passing it from distribution center one to a third party over here and another third party there, you know, six, six yeah. seven parties. And that's what's happening with prepared food delivery. Everything right. is people are trying to cobble together all these. I'm going to rent a cloud kitchen. I'm going to use a third party delivery app. I'm going to outsource my software to Olo. I'm going to, you know, and you're cobbling together like five different pieces to try and make this thing work. And it's all just really, really incremental, you know, and here's Fred Smith who just disrupted the whole thing by saying, I'm going to vertically integrate it. I'm going to build amazing software to control this entire process and I will blow the competitors out of the water. And that's what Fred did, right? I mean, FedEx, you know, went from three to seven days to 1030 the next morning, um, you know, and, yeah. and the only way he can do that is to control every nuance. Yeah. No, it reminds me a lot of, you know, what I've told people over the years. I mean, I think from my first day when I I first, you know, I've tried a lot of these services out as a a customer for sure, but uh, also as a worker, a courier, a delivery person. And when I did my first DoorDash delivery, maybe five or six years ago, I think I instantly saw the fact that, you know, to me, it seemed like a game of telephone, right? Because you have a dasher or a courier that's involved in the normal delivery system. You have a courier that's involved. You have a restaurant that's involved. Sometimes the operations, you know, the call support team needs to at DoorDash needs to call in and then you also have a customer and so you can imagine when this little simple you know order for a burrito with no salsa or extra cheese or whatever goes through four different people the end product is often uh, you know pretty screwed up pretty wrong and uh, you know that's sort of one thing that I find too I, I guess with the current uh, system, you know, the current delivery system, what do you think is the biggest challenge that these other competitors have faced? Is it customer satisfaction? Is it the driver piece? Or again, is it that whole value chain? Well, I think it's a whole value chain, but I think most importantly, it's the driver piece, right? Mm-hmm. If I cannot get more than 1.2 jobs an hour done, the companies can't afford to pay me to do that, right? Which is why there is this massive turnover, you know, every time I get in a Lyft or an Uber, I ask the driver, have you ever done food? You know, and the answer <laughs> is always going to be no or once, right? You know, yeah. and, um, it, you know, so it's the worst job in the gig economy, right? And our goal was, you know, again, whiteboard day one was we're going to take the worst job in the gig economy and make it the best. I mean, we have mm-hmm. drivers. Well, first of all, we have no turnovers. Seventy-five percent of our drivers in every single market started with us the first week. So we're going on five years here in Indianapolis, where they don't turn over. The customer mm-hmm. retention and loyalty is incredible, right? Because you get this experience. So I'm going to get this hot, delicious food from a happy person in 16 minutes. I'm not going to DoorDash, right? I don't care about Joe's walk, you know, as far as my brand of preference for fried rice. You know, if I'm getting a great quality product fast and convenient and, and, and with no fees and, you know, from friendly drivers and what that does with no driver turnover, not only does it save us um, economically from recruiting and things like that, but these drivers are better, right? They are professionals that Mm -hmm. are faster. I used to go out and drive and, you know, just to keep my foot in it and, you know, see the customers and, and, you know, finally they, they had to ask me to stop because it was literally... (laughs) too slow. I was messing up the system because, you know, you can't, you know, you can't do it part time, right? You have to learn Mm. the streets and the, and where to turn and what side of the building is this address. And, you know, and just the nuances that, you know, like Tom Hanks in the movie Castaway, you know, we're always standing around with stopwatches everywhere saying, where can we shave four seconds? Where can we shave 60 seconds? Where can, you know, and, and all of that time matters. And that is the FedEx model, right? 
Yeah. So what challenges have you seen on the driver's side? I mean, one thing that you said that stood out to me is, you know, that customers have to come out and meet the driver at the curbside. And I can tell you that this doesn't work too well with most other services, Uber X, especially even Uber pool, where, you know, everyone knows that some, you know, there's multiple people waiting on you. What have you done either on the customer side to sort of train them or, you know, you know, to kind of encourage that on drivers, like just, just in general, what, what challenges have you seen with the drivers? Truly, um, you know, from the curbside delivery, that was our biggest risk, right? We, mm. we, we didn't know. I mean, the cur- customer might say, hey, I'll pay $5, come to my house, yep. and we won't do it, right? We say, no, we don't do it. And, um, and honestly, you know, we've done almost 2 million deliveries, and I can count on one hand the, the number of complaints I've seen about that. Mm-hmm. You know, the customer is happy to do it. We do a great job of talking about the gig economy and explaining it to, um, to our our, um, our customers. And because we have very high frequently returned customers and we have the same drivers, a relationship builds up again. You read our reviews and you'll yeah. see people saying, oh, I was so great. happy to see Alex again. You know, like, like it becomes sort of this little family thing that, um, and it's at scale too, right? You know, we're doing in Indianapolis today, we'll do a thousand orders. I mean, we were over 450 just during the lunch hour and a half to two hours and never mm-hmm. had a delivery over 40 minutes. And we did yeah. that with 35 drivers, right? If DoorDash has 100 orders in an hour, they need 100 drivers, right? Yeah, and we can do 100 true. orders with fewer than 50 drivers. Yeah. I mean, it seems like for a lot of these drivers, there's, you know, there's opportunity for them with uh, with Cluster Truck. And it, it sounds like you guys are providing a lot of value to the drivers. I, I mean, you mentioned ratings a couple of times. I, I pulled up, so I don't know what ratings specifically you're looking at, but like on the App Store, Cluster Truck is a 4.9 star rating. On iTunes, 3,000 ratings. DoorDash is a 4.8 star, 5 million ratings. Postmates is a 4.8 star, 857,000 ratings. How well, do you that's, look that's, at that's the app store. So that's, that's talking mm-hmm. about the app, right? You're they talking about the app, actual so satisfaction a, talking about of like the Yelp or go to Google or go to trust pilot of the customer. You know, I mean, I, I, I actually, I'll be honest. I was surprised. <laughs> I was surprised that Postmates and DoorDash were that high. So it may be just what you're saying, right? I mean, it may be that it's more of a, a reflection of the app, um, but yeah, I, cause I the think app what, store is yeah. rating the app, not, not the quality of the service. Yeah. Well, well, let's talk about the quality of the service. But first, I mean, one thing you mentioned is the the train. You know, I, I almost feel like there's this training aspect to the customers. We saw this with uh, the company Via and Rideshare. They were one of the first to do sort of the shared um, pooling option, which is kind of similar to what Uber now calls Express Pool, where you actually don't get picked up um, in front of your house. You have to walk to the main street, which cuts off, right. you know, like kind of like that first and end, which causes a lot of hassle and friction for everyone. And there were really never any complaints about that because they kind of did it from day one. They trained their customers, their customers knew, their drivers knew, right? Everyone knew. It sounds like you guys are onto something uh, similar there with your with your customers. That's absolutely right, right? You know, we have to you know, and again, in our early days, that was a training of the customer, right? You know, how do we communicate mm-hmm. to them that they need to come out? So, you know, now we do a much better so job. So how did you do that? You know, we or how do you do them that? and inform them and, you know, and tell them, you know, okay. remember, you have to meet the driver at the curb, you know, like, and, and yeah. uh, I said it, it, it was something that kept me up at night because it was fundamental to our business model, but there was no way to test it. Right. The only way you can test it is to actually launch the company and see what happens. And fortunately yeah. for us, the customer has been great about it. Yeah. Um, so, again, we, we don't get any pushback. Yeah. So it sounds like on the driver's side, uh, we're, we're on the same page there. It sounds like they're getting more jobs or making more money. The retention is higher. It sounds like you guys have a pretty good model there on the customer side though. If I'm a, you know, a, a con- you know, so let's take me, I, I've placed probably hundreds, if not thousands of orders across Postmates, DoorDash, Uber Eats, et cetera. It's sort of my job, but I also am lazy and have a toddler at home. So I have a lot of reasons to do so, but I'm going to order lunch. Why am I going to choose a cluster truck over any of the numerous other options that are probably already on my phone? Because it's going to be better quality. It's going to be faster and it's going to be more reliable, right? Like when you log into our system, we're Mm -hmm. going to tell you exactly when your food is going to be delivered and we're accurate. And again, this is machine learning, right? We're Mm -hmm. accurate within two minutes of that time. So even if you look at that and say 55 minutes, 
if you're a cluster truck customer, you're still going to say, okay, click, because I know that that number is right, right? That, yeah. That's impossible in the third-party model. The other thing is the whole six minutes thing, right? That your food is always going to be hot and fresh and delicious and exactly the way it's supposed to be because A, it's being delivered by a professional and B, it's never more than six minutes old. So even if you looked and you ordered at 55 minutes, you know that that food isn't going to be 55 minutes old, right? If you look at DoorDash and you, and it says this restaurant usually delivers within (laughs) 55 minutes during this time period, yeah. That food is going to be 50 minutes old, right? Yeah. Because they're, they're cooking the food. They can't coordinate the kitchen to the driver, right? Which we can. They can't coordinate the, the, the I food. I mean, they do do that. I just don't think that they, you know, kind of going back to that game of telephone, right? They, they don't do as good of a job, right? I think, you know, they have certain restaurants that they're partnered with and others that they're not where they're working on some of those integrations. But I think you're right. They don't do as good of a job. Right. Yeah, so we'll, 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 we'll leave it at that. <laughs> but it, <laughs> well, it, it, and I mean, yeah, I do just... agree. The only thing that I would push back a little on is sort of the quality of the food. I mean, I've never tried cluster truck, but I think quality in general is subjective. And one of the, you know, big, uh, you know, trends we've seen on the food delivery side is that a majority of these orders on Postmates, DoorDash, et cetera, are coming from sort of like what I call like low value fast food chains, you know, Taco Bell, McDonald's, a lot of those kind of either like low value or fast food type orders, uh, uh, I guess is that that's one area where you know if I want a McDonald's burger or a Taco Bell, how do you compete with that um, as a cluster truck? Don't you know? I ordered from DoorDash the other day. I ordered a um, a Dave's single from Wendy's, mm-hmm. four dollars and fifty cents. Wendy's was offering me free delivery. I know for yep. a fact that DoorDash was bribing drivers an extra four dollars <laughs> and fifty cents that day Sounds or that right. hour to make that delivery. So I got a. From a customer standpoint, I had a pretty good experience. The food got to me in about 45 minutes. It's a mm. Wendy's burger. Who cares? You know, it yep. tasted like a Wendy's burger. And, you know, but nobody made any money there, right? Like, you <laughs> well, know what I mean, I like, mean that's, a like, whole, you know, that's a whole nother, another story, right? I mean, as far as well, it, making it is money. It's story today, right? You okay. know, none of these business models are sustainable. So you can look at it and say, yeah, my DoorDash experience isn't that good. I order a lot from Shift. Shift. Um, you know, through Target and buy stuff. And, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, and I always talk to the delivery people, right? Oh, tell me about the experience. Well, I was 15 minutes away from the store. I drove to the store. I shopped in the store. I, you know, I bought my wrapping paper and tape and ribbons on ship, you know, so probably $45 order. Driver made eight bucks. It took them 90 minutes. Right. Yeah. So t- who's making money there? Did Target make any money? No. I think, Did the I, think I bought a car money? seat <laughs> from yeah, Target using ship I bought a TV for my office the other day on ship. Right. I mean, again, my experience was fantastic. You know, it came in under two hours. You know, I picked the time slot when I wanted it. But, you yeah. know, the driver well, didn't make enough money and Target didn't make any money. And, you know, ship gave me, you know, I have a subscription, $75 a year and I get free delivery. Yeah. Well, you know, I order from them all the time. I promise you they're losing money on every single Chris Baggett transaction. How long yeah. can that ca- keep up? Yeah. Well, Chris, I think this is a good topic to end on. I mean, as far as the health of the delivery industry as a whole, it sounds like you're pretty, um, you know, con- I guess confident in the fact that, you know, there's either, you know, this can't keep up for a while. I mean, I'm curious to know, I guess, so you look out and you see there's Postmates, there's DoorDash. I mean, if we kind of just call it the whole delivery space, are there companies that you think have a sustainable model? Or if not, what what do you sort of see going forward? I see models like I see us or models like Are there other companies like Cluster Truck? I haven't seen any, you know, I mean, Mm -hmm. everyone is trying to solve this problem incrementally. You know, you look at um, Sears, you know, yeah, I, I started my career in the catalog business. Sears was my customer. You know, in the mm-hmm. 1980s and 90s, I mean, Sears was like number three, four, or five on the Fortune 500, right? They owned warehouses. They had massive distribution. They were the everything store. What happened? What happened yeah. was they looked at this incrementally. Hey, we can tack this onto the side. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the first thing I thought when I saw Grubhub go public was Groupon, Right. And Groupon was insurmountable, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, right? It was the fastest growing company in history, went public at a, you know, I mean, it was amazing and ubiquitous and everyone loved it. And then four years later, they don't, I mean, they exist as a company, but, you know, it's just not the same. You think about travel, these marketplaces, Expedia, first way I booked travel was through Expedia, right? 
Mm -hmm. 70% of all travel now, I mean, 100% of all travel was done in a marketplace 10 years ago. Now, 70% of all travel is done directly with the travel provider, right? So, you know, I, 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 I can imagine a world where there's no DoorDash, if that's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, yeah. I, I'll be honest, I'm a big fan of using DoorDash, but I also think the business model and probably anyone who follows my Twitter feed knows is severely, you know, especially in food delivery, I think the business models are severely uh, flawed. So I guess what do you see? Go but I, I, you know, the real question is, I mean, you know, is profitability that important, though, in, in your mind? I mean, you know, Uber <laughs> is not profitable. Lyft is not profitable. <laughs> how, right, how important right. do you think profitability is? I think it's desperately important. That's why, you know, we're the only profitable model, right? We're, mm -hmm. We are profitable um, and we're wildly gotcha. profitable. So how and do you so, get to that point? How do you get to that next level then as a business for Cluster Truck? Do you need to sort of wait out DoorDash and Postmates to, you know, kind of go by the wayside? Every, or every, do you think you can... Every city we compete in, we're the, we're the number one provider. So in okay. every one of our markets, we win. Um, and mm -hmm. we're not in many markets. So now the question for us strategically is, do we go out and raise $100 million or do we partner with, you know, big brands that, that you know, can carry this vision forward? That's what's so great about the Kroger partnership. Yeah. And, you know, they have 2,800 underutilized kitchens, right? Mm -hmm. And they make good food and we can put our kitchens and we can make that food and, um, you know, use our software model layer, layered on top of that. And suddenly there's, you know, I mean, you look at Cloud Kitchens or Kitchens United and, you know, you know, it's, it's going to be a very slow process to give this incremental benefit that really isn't going to solve the problem. And, um, yeah. you know, I mean, this is going to change quickly. Like, this will be a very different conversation five years from now, right? Yeah. What is the conversation going to be five years from now? Remember DoorDash. Remember <laughs> that whole thing. Well, I mean, it's like PetSmart. I mean, okay. I started Exact Target in 2000 and... You know, and we were this Midwest company doing great business and had some really interesting customers, and but nobody ever heard of Exact Target. And suddenly the dot com bust happened, right? And mm -hmm. and suddenly, you know, and all these companies that seemed ubiquitous were gone. And yeah. um, and, and you know, a few lived. Amazon, you know, came out of it, but PetSmart or you know, whatever the sock puppet one was, you know, and the same thing has just happened, right? I mean, SoftBank is pulling back from term sheets. People are being laid off. You're out there in L.A., Zoom pizza. Yeah. I mean, my goodness, <laughs> that was like the dumbest idea I ever heard. You know, you're going to cook pizzas in a I truck. I definitely and agree worth, on that one. And that's worth $4 billion? Um, you know, so, you know, suddenly everyone is going to start, and they are. I mean, my phone rings every day. It's, hmm. it's, you know, wait, wait, you actually can do this? hot prepared food delivery of high quality that has great customer satisfaction and retention, and you can do it profitably. I mean, there can be no other business model, but a business model that can be profitable. And there's yeah. not going to be a profitable model where you see Uber and DoorDash or Uber and Grubhub combining. So they get market power so they can raise prices. I mean, how much are you willing to pay Harry? Yeah, definitely. 50% well, uh... premiums, 100% <laughs> premiums to get this taco delivered to you. And then if there's a competitor that'll do just as good a job, but bring it to you for free. Yeah, definitely. Well, I appreciate, uh, you know, and I think I just want to ask you one quick question to wrap up. Where do you see what's next for cluster truck? I, I guess, what do you, what do you guys see happening in the next six or 12 months? What are you guys uh, focused on? We're just focused on growth, right? You know, we're going to expand. As I said, we just launched okay. this Kroger partnership. I don't know if you've seen the press on that or not, but um, you know, we're, we're going to continue to march forward and, Go city by city more by cities. city. And more okay. cities, more suburbs. You know, the suburb test is really interesting for us because, you know, we just wanted to make sure we can get around. Will there be customer demand? Yeah. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of these office parks in the suburb where you can't just take the elevator down and walk right. outside, you know, that, that you have to drive somewhere. So those are doing really, really well for us. Offices, and I'm sorry, I know I'm babbling too long, but, you know, offices <laughs> no are really interesting because one of the things we're very disruptive to catering. Um, yeah because everyone can get what they want. So with our model, you can just pass around a link or you can add a link to your invitation. We've got a really good Slack application type slash hungry into a Slack, any channel and, um, mm -hmm. and everyone can order what they want. So now we don't have to have this conversation about Panera or Jimmy John's or pizza. I want a pizza. You want a sandwich. You want pad Thai. Great. Get what you want. 
Very cool. Awesome. Well, I'll expect to see uh, big things from you guys over the next year or two and going in the future. And hopefully we can, we can stay in touch on it. Uh, appreciate you coming on. If people want to learn more about Cluster Truck or if they're in one of the cities uh, that you guys are operating and want to try it as a customer or a driver, what, what should they do? Where should they go? Oh, ClusterTruck.com. Use the promo code CB3100 and um, they will get 50% off. All right, cool. We'll leave that uh, link and code in the show notes. And thanks for coming on, Chris. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. 